The Geneva Reading Series awakens. <laughs> Welcome back. When I first arrived at Geneva, the powers that be housed me within a little office on the second floor of Ferncliffe. A very little office, <laughs> closet-like, Harry Potter under the stairs. <laughs> I was squeezed between the offices of Dr. Nykirk and Dr. Zabo. Because the width of my office was so conservative, Dr. Nykirk and Dr. Zabo could have conversations with one another through their walls, as if there was no middleman me receiving everything. They spoke and tapped out secret codes, all of which I sensed were evaluations of me. 100% positive from one side, and on the other side, 120% making fun of creative writers for being born with the affliction of their brains. You can guess which side was which. But I liked my little office. I'd never had a room of my own in which one wall was a window. <laughs> and what of you? I could look right down the throat of the entire campus and see who was coming up the walk to terrify me with their presence. Conversations scare me when I don't know you. And I didn't know anyone back then. So all your talk, friendly though it was, fell on me like the first drops of rain round Noah's boat. <laughs> and imagine me, one without a golden ticket, listening to the lovely family fun and laughter inside the boat. <laughs> when you're new to a place, the whole wide world is an inside joke that you're the butt of. <laughs> one day, as predestination would have it, <laughs> I met Dr. Eric Miller. I heard knocks on my door and came out of the tiny office and there he was, standing in the hall, as though he'd been standing there, waiting for me to come out, the way a cat stands before a hole in the wall, waiting for furry food to jump onto its fangs. <laughs> there we stood, cat and mouse, my soft Welsh eyes drowning in his dark as perdition gaze. <laughs> Since day one of my life in the tiny office, I drew pictures and pasted them all over the walls. Pictures on the Zabo side behind me, a wall that pulsated with zen. <laughs> and pictures on the Nykirk wall in front of me, which pulsated with the feeling that Nykirk can see through walls and that he was watching me any time he felt like laughing. <laughs> I taped the pictures on Nykirk's wall triple deep. In that cozy little office, I also hung flowers and even with the help of Ryan Grydell, hung a clown painting on the ceiling so that every time I tipped my head back, I could experience what it might look like just before getting stomped to death by a gaggle of clowns. It was a little poison pill of humility that I took 30 times a day. I did all this secretion of artistic resin in order to emulate the creatures I most admire, the aliens from the films Alien and Aliens. <laughs> they make every space they inhabit look like themselves. The moment you step into an alien's parlor, you know by the art on the walls that you are about to die in a way only a Swiss surrealist could imagine. I felt cool in my office, B.A. I felt Swiss. <laughs> Until I walked out into the hall that day and bumped into Dr. Eric Miller. He's intimidating not only because he's handsome and does not age, <laughs> but because he has a brain that could hamstring Paul Bunyan's best friend, Babe the Blue Ox, right in front of Bunyan. And when the mighty axeman went to get vengeance, Miller would say, yeah, what? <laughs> and the contest would be over. I came out into the hall, and after one look at Miller, I thought he might look through me in Nykirk fashion, but instead he looked beyond me to the walls that hung with my art. I thought he might say something like, wow, but instead he looked directly at me with his wine dark eyes and said, when did this room stop being the bathroom? <laughs> understood the light two-tap knock on my door that preceded our conversation. Now I understood the irritation on his face when I opened the door and his eyes said, took you long enough. And then the surprise in his eyes that lasted 0.68 seconds when he saw that the bathroom was no longer a bathroom housing a toilet but an office housing me. That was our first conversation. But in time, our friendship bloomed into another moment, not three months ago, when Dr. Miller and Dr. Kilpatrick happened to be walking by me on their way into Ferncliff. 
At this point, both doctors had agreed to read at the GRS, and so every time I passed them, I quivered with gratitude. But as Dr. Miller passed me that day, he smiled with his perfect GQ teeth, and then pointed to Shirley and himself and said, we are the reading series. <laughs> And again, I knew humility. <laughs> and though Dr. Miller was teasing, I saw again what I always see when I look into his eyes, just the slightest bit of remaining disappointment that I displaced the convenient toilet on floor two of Fernton. <laughs> Time passes, though, and I think I've made up for not being a toilet. <laughs> I've learned to brace myself well for seeing Dr. Miller around Ferncliff. I'm getting better at not spending most of my days trying to invent comebacks for the witty and hilariously sarcastic things he says in passing. <laughs> He's building me up, I suspect, so that one day we can spar in earnest. What a terrifying future awaits me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Eric Miller. <laughs> I mean, I've been introduced before. <laughs> Usually, you know, no, oh, that was too much. That was plenty, man. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another drink. Water. <laughs> but if I would have known about this, it would have been something else. <laughs> oh, hi. Sort of point out that Matt Meyer is back, who was a writing major at Geneva College, graduated in 2013, Matt? Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> and Matt's standing in as a representative for all the other writing majors, graduates, and thanks everybody for coming out, all the returners and faculty <coughs> members, staff, friends, lovers, who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> I turned 49 Saturday, and uh, it's, a, it's an auspicious moment, I suppose. Um, Emily Dar very generously and sweetly came over to the table and Alexander Dining Hall Friday evening and said, happy birthday, very brightly and warmly, and I was so moved, the only thing I could say was, 366. <laughs> the countdown had begun. But the next day, I got a card from my father, and I think I'm going to start reading his reassuring words to help me recover from what just happened. <laughs> and I told my dad that I would read this to you when I talked to him Saturday. <clears throat> Happy birthday, son of my youth. He just turned 70. Time is the measure of values. What is lasting stays and the rest is only a small mark of personal difficulty that fades with time. It reveals the character of each person and spurs on individuals to put forth the effort to get the sail up, catch the wind and ride the swelling crest of high tide before the ebb and flow slows down and your ship enters the harbor of life coming to rest in the arms of Jesus you are still riding the crest dad I needed to hear that thanks dad um, and it reminded me that language is always something that we learn as Jeremy was helping us to think about and that it's immensely complex, and that working to master it, to gain the intimacy that makes possible, I mean, to learn it, to gain intimacy uh, that brings such satisfaction is one of our great delights. And I'm thankful for Dan for uh, making this possible um, to that end. Annie Dillard, in her magnificent book, Holy the Firm, writes, how can people think that artists seek a name? A name like a face is something you have when you're not alone. There is no such thing as an artist. There is only the world lit or unlit as the light allows. When the candle is burning, who looks at the wick? When the candle is out,
Who needs it? But the world without light is wasteland and chaos, and a life without sacrifice is abomination. And that sacrifice is what this language is intended to help us to think about. I've gathered uh, together some writings, uh, different genres uh, that I've that I've written over the past uh, decade or so. Um, many of them are short. Many of them are lyrics um, in form. Uh, so please, if you should feel the urge to applaud when it sounds like I finished something, just kind of restrain yourself uh, if necessary. Uh, and, uh, and I'll just um, uh, start reading through without much further uh, explanation. I gathered these under the title High Water, Big Boat. On our condition, winter 2007, in view of Lent and John Dunn. Someday I think we'll awake and we'll see what we've done, chasing and blundering and desecrating in this drugged haze thinking we're making it to God knows where, falling beams busting down across our backs. Funny how even pain stops doing its work after a time and leaves us with our wounds undressed and unnoticed. We're all just fine, of course. We've never been better. How did the prodigal come to his senses? Show me, show me how he caught the scent, leaned toward that vision of health and laughter and fine wine. The wine of mirth poured out of his father's heart to warm his wizened soul. It's over, he, far from home, suddenly saw. The spell broke, the enchantment snapped. He sprang from the nightmare with haste because he could see that it was just that, a sham, a deception, a pretension. The great passageway into the real was right there before him. Help us now, our brother, long returned, because we're yet lost, so lost. The blood of Jesus, how precious the flow, the only fount I know, we sang innocently but wisely as children. God made flesh, what Alistair McIntyre calls rational, dependent animals, how absurd. Crucified, great smashing of bone and tissue, of magnificent matter, and then a trickle of life from this one man, this one body, a Jew, a peasant, a son. They thought they could turn him into nothing, thought they were Hamlet-like, sending him to hell, twisting in their own coils, writhing in the agony of self-deception and abomination. Their curses rose from the depths of their mangled souls, a scream as visceral as birth, as harsh as frost, as grotesque as death, crucify him so we can live. But their dream is our nightmare, as our guilt shamelessly piles up and our cancerous visions of eternity give shape to molten steel in forms far more deadly than Weber's iron cage because this cage is somehow alive and comes after us chasing us down with fierce and ruthless force, giving no quarter to spirit, and trapping us in its cells, clean, shiny, dead, where we're free to be prisoners of our senses. But animals bleed, even in cages. As long as blood remains, the hope may too. The hope for transfusion, for salvation, from one body to another, for rescue through that blood into health and propriety and peace, where cleansing goes deep and demons are sealed off and the machinery dies. But how do we attain that cleansing? How do we turn toward it before our last drop leaves us and we depart uncovered into night? Where is the exit from this dreary plane? Could it be that this crucified one died for love, to save us after all, to show us the way home? Well, if 
the Jedi person can fix this. <laughs> Last day. Today is your last on earth. At sunset, you will be removed to a darkened theater somewhere in space where you will spend the rest of your days, morning, noon, and night, watching film. What will you see on this most strange, most holy day, your last day on earth? The slender green shoot tilting toward you blown gently by summer breeze, the striated bark of the bur oak ascending with solemnity into the sky, the play of light running through the woods, making color of the dark, the wonder of your skin, taut, wrinkling, connecting grace, as even the mosquito knows, tissue and texture and line and light Mountains in motion, lit with life, lit with you, for now, on this day, this holy day. Discovering the old world. It's a canopy of grace I see now. It's warming winds, awakening joy and hope. The steady, stately greens inviting repose. Trees that shoot to eternity, blossoming as they rise. We live here, not in the digital dreamscape of shrinking hope and darkened minds. We live here in this poignant peace where rest rewards the still seeking soul. We live here as kingdom comes, lilies singing of a new old day of water moving toward wine. living outside. We must give ourselves over to living outside. You say, why? I say, if not outside, then where? Inside a house, a library, an office, a car, each a small universe insistently isolating itself from that upon which it stands, that which surrounds it, has built it, maintains it. Yet that new little universe with its safe ceilings, its fine fixtures, its shiny walls, its sparkling screens, doesn't even know the real one, where squirrels run and oaks rise and the scent of the earth takes you back to an all-knowing innocence. And you find that you've been freed from the diminishing interiority of the inside world, the world we made to forget where we are. St. Paul made tents and admitted to living in one. What did he know? Open the windows. Turn off the air to get some. Breathe deep, human child. Breathe deep. Harvest. They travel to distant lands come summer, London, Venice, Santa Fe. But I'm happy here in the company of corn rising, the strawberries slow blush, and an eight-year-old about to play his first baseball game, bounding out of the house this misty morning, 8 a.m., Two gloves and a ball in hand, suited up in bright and brilliant red, a Patterson fireman this year. Did mom send you out? Nope. Reach, thud. Fire, thud. The mist turns liquid and warm. The red spreads, ripening, June to July in a flash. Go ahead, friends. Take your leave. I'll stay right here. I'm headed out to the old ball game. This is a 
an essay that I wrote in honor of our late colleague Howard Matsubose, um, who passed away this past January. Uh, it was published as an op-ed in the Harrisburg Patriot News. Howard was a talker, and he talked ideas. For the first six years of my teaching career, we shared a hallway, and an hour there here, an hour there, an office on either side of the hall. A historian, Howard spoke with a flair that seemed to flow from his hyphenated last name, Matson Bose. The conversation that began when I showed up 16 years ago for an interview died only due to natural causes. It was a warm conversation, at times heated. Howard was a mid-century liberal of Stevenson Kennedy vintage. I, young and contrarian, usually landed to the left and right at once of wherever Howard happened to be, sometimes on purpose. I looked on the liberalism Howard winsomely defended with little appreciation, or rather, with too little appreciation. This is what he helped me to see. As a teenager growing up just outside of Chicago, Howard had found his political soul reading the New York Times account of the McCarthy era. His sense of outrage was visceral, he told me. He, the son of Swedish immigrants, was inspired by the liberal hope of a common decency and generosity. Through the many shifts in liberalism, he remained faithful, plumping door to door for votes, taking the Democratic side in public debates, which was a rather risky thing on this campus, by the way. Um, and above all, keeping the ideals at the heart of the liberal tradition before our eyes. Slowly, in my case, skepticism softened into admiration. And that admiration took root mainly because Howard wasn't, in the end, a mere political liberal. Before that, he was an intellectual liberal. Therein lay a treasure I could not deny. In the liberal arts, Howard was a master. He knew the lineage that had formed him so finely and delighted in it. A conversation, took with, a conversation with Howard took one from ancient Athens through medieval Paris to 19th century London in 10 minutes flat. He dipped into Kierkegaard in the spirit of a boy playing baseball in spring. As he spoke, whether across the table or behind a lectern, his eyes gleamed with contagious purpose. When he died this past January, many former students remembered the discussions he and his wife hosted through the years, evenings spent on the deep questions of life, as one, now himself a professor, put it. Howard taught, in the words of another, the classical liberal ideas that we live by today. This was simply what college was for to Howard. More particularly, it was what he thought our college was for, despite countervailing winds. The ideals that spark our way do not live by books alone, he knew, but through people. People living in places structured for their preservation and advance. Howard believed that without generosity of mind and depth of spirit, this world is a harsher place. About the ideas themselves, about their truth, we might, we will disagree. But apart from a foundation of respect for ideas and their centrality in our lives, all debates about their worth and about the world itself move from hostility, move from incivility to hostility to worse. And the great hope of, of a liberal society, of a place where we live together in honor of the dignity of life, fades like fall. The liberal arts aren't the only pathway toward our highest ends, to be sure but they have aided decisively all pathways we've ever known. Keeping them clear, straight, and manifest. The darkness that many of us feel today in an age marked by so vicious and spurious form of realism may, in part, be the fruit of the liberal arts fading among us, leaving us inevitably less free. I know what counsel Howard would offer. He would urge deep, costly institutional commitments to preserve and prosper liberal learning. Do we have the will to heed it? Howard, hopeful soul, would no doubt smile at the question and say, yes.
So much for that bit about water moving toward wine. Four uh, sh short poems to my wife. The first two are in celebration of anniversary, our anniversary, which are on, which is April 11th. At this moment, in the burst of spring, we mark the planting of a seed. So small, weightless. So large, weighted with the promise of life. In the midst of our dying, our life has grown. Blossoms surround. Roots drive down in holy ground. April 11th, part two. I dug a garden for you today, love. A spaded square for order. A seated space for promise. Softened soil for hope. You, Christmas 2009. A Christmas star for failing sight when journeying far in dark and night. Your gift of light illumines me, December white, dazzling sea. Valentine 22. If you are sweet, chocolate is bitter, roses are black, a fastball's a spitter. If you are sweet, spring is a blizzard, the beach is a desert, a kitten's a lizard. <laughs> Since you're so sweet, everything's better. Black skies are blue. A tweet is a letter. <laughs> Can't stand it anymore, huh? I thought you were doing it on purpose. <laughs> it's sad. I haven't gotten over the toilet issue. <laughs> Beautiful. When I was um, 13, my parents um, moved our family to Brazil when my parents became missionaries. And I'm going to read a poem about uh, the return, one of the return trips I had to Brazil after a 26-year absence when I was part of a faculty development trip, uh, which I'll actually be speaking about Friday at 10 o'clock uh, in a forum that we're sponsoring the Honor Society is. Um, so a poem about a return trip that I had, and then uh, an essay uh, that I'll close with um, that's set in Brazil, in part. To Brazil and back. I saw a man's dripping eyes and heard a woman's searing speech, and ate rice beside the poor and met an Amazonian chief and sang along with all his children and felt a dealer's silent grief and breathed Rio's seething air and smelled Brasilia's high dry heat and clapped for a band's blazing beauty and cried at a pastor's humble reach and came home with Augustine's hope and flaming outrageous multiplicity finds union in thee. Epiphanies of Gratitude I was in the midst of big changes that autumn of 1981 when we piled into our chaperones' cars and headed to the Chapada for our annual retreat. The WE was a student body of a high school in Cuiabá, Brazil, owned and operated by the Wycliffe Bible Translators. The Chapada is a towering plateau that encircles the large basin in which Cuiabá is located an old western mining town founded during an 18th century gold rush, now balloon to a half million inhabitants. We students, all children of missionaries, came to a grand total of seven. The chaperones may have outnumbered us. <laughs> Five of us were freshmen, including me. My family had just landed in Brazil the previous winter. The other students had lived in Brazil most of their lives. I was a newcomer. I was a newcomer, and indeed, it was all new to me. 
How to explain the wonder I felt as we lugged our gear down massive steps carved out of rock and I saw for the first time our destination. It was a clearing in the Matu, not quite jungle, but almost, at the foot of a waterfall, some 20 feet wide and 75 feet or so below the dirt lot where we had parked. In the 1990s, the area would become almost completely commercialized, but 30 years ago, it was as pristine a spot as one could imagine a car being able to get to. A smaller waterfall was hidden a few hundred yards away from the one we camped beside, and a massive, majestic, postcard-worthy waterfall tumbled, tumbled over a huge cliff a couple of miles away, the Vale de Nueva, Bridal Vale Falls. It was, and still is, an area rich in beauty, and now one, sadly, that mainly the rich enjoy. Our gang set up headquarters beneath a rustic pavilion with a thatched roof, and someone started a fire for our opening night school, the Brazilian-style barbecue that is the country's signature meal on the same plane as samba and futebol and carnaval. The guys, four of us, set out to find a cluster of trees suitable for stringing up hammocks. We slept under brilliant starry skies those nights, with the roar of the waterfall in the background and who knows what treacherous animals and insects nearby. The care, so I easily brushed my fears aside. It was all too grand for me to grasp, and this trip was turning out to be the most magical experience yet of a 10-month odyssey that had left me breathless. I love football. I love my new friends. I loved life. Any country that could pull off something like the Chapada was okay with me. I drank it in with a gusto I would not have believed myself to be capable of just one year before. All of this was, I knew full well, a gift. I wasn't sure how the giver of those gifts felt about the Simon and Garfunkel's greatest hits cassette we played constantly on the retreat. But I don't think we ever took it out of the little tape player someone brought along. Their music fit the moment. Soft, sensitive harmonies, adolescent energy, and most of all, the youthful belief in beauty. A beauty delicate, difficult to touch, but still within grasp. Simon sang of kissing honey hair with grateful tears. And I knew that gratitude was possible and that it was good. I was living it, at least for a moment, at age 14. Is not ingratitude a willful blindness, the mere refusal to pay attention? Is not gratitude as simple as air, as basic as blood? All that I've seen since that retreat leaves me nodding my head. An elderly Brazilian man of Italian descent stumbles from the bus stop down a long crater-filled dirt road and into our little church, if you can call it that. It's a formal tribal housing of a missionary family that once worked with Indians. It is, to say the least, inelegant. The man is crippled. How he learned of us, we don't know, not because he doesn't try to tell us, but because we understand so little Portuguese. Despite the fact that my father, in the country only a year, has, has to painstakingly write out each lesson and sermon before delivering them in his heavy American Appalachian accent, Senor Alfonso comes back week after week, one of only a handful of congregants. He lights up when he hears us singing songs that sometime in his life became precious to him. Later, he'll introduce us to his daughter and her family. They'll, became a, they'll become a mainstay in my parents' ministry in the years that follow. I'm the RA on the west side of a long hall during my senior year of college, and Todd is the RA on the east side. It's a dorm of mainly freshmen. At the beginning of the spring semester, Todd announces that he's going to begin what he calls the Toward the East. African American and raised by relatives in Philadelphia, he three years earlier had arrived at our white Bible college, a recent convert, on fire, as we would say, with red t-shirts emblazoned with phrases like, ask me about Jesus. <laughs> the fire did not die. His life during those years was a steady rebuke to me, and it remained that way to the end. Todd spends 
most of our last semester of college on a Pauline mission to his youthful charges, sleeping on the floor beside their bunks. When my brother gets word that my wife is in labor, he on a lark leaves behind his wife and three children to rush across the state in their beat up Camry. Five hours later, as sleepy but, but, but bemused nurses look on, he gives me a bear hug. It's 3.30 a.m. He welcomes two hour Christopher into the family with his typical panache and drives back home 12 hours later. <laughs> The next week he calls to tell me he's still on a high from Christopher. <laughs> We're brand new to the church, but to our surprise, the deacons begin a meals brigade after our third child arrives. On a hot July day, a mother of an adult daughter with Williams syndrome brings us a delicious chicken salad served in carved out cantaloupes, along with steaming corn on the cob, which she drove over to Ohio to buy. She and her daughter run in and out of the house in a rush. They're taking a meal to another church family too, she tells me. The family of a young father dying of melanoma. A man picks up a seed and says quietly that unless it is buried, there will be no fruit. The man later thrusts a solid, cavernous cup at his thirsty friends. Come, drink, he urges. Drink it all. Drink and live. Also, just before he leaves them, he cooks them a breakfast of fried fish. Just 20 years after the Chapada retreat, I'm, on, I'm at a fall conference on the coast of Southern California. A friend of 10 years whom I met at seminary is talking to me about gratitude. He, as much as any friend I have, knows it's a talk I need. He himself survived a battle with cancer as a teenager. He has something to say. He talks to me about the fall, about corruption, about the curse, about our just condemnation. Nothing we have here, he hopes I'll grasp, is deserved. Any loss that we may sense now will be infinitely compounded if we fail to acknowledge the good that God, even as we speak, is mercifully preserving for us. I know all this, I think. But I also know that such knowing hasn't led to a lasting gratitude. My friend has some sense of the cramped, dank spaces I've lived in, he tries to budge the barricaded door just to crack. A year passes and we're at another conference. I tell him how I stood in line at the airport that morning and recalled the professor who mentored both of us during our seminary years. His faithful and wise ministrations opened my eyes to a world, or rather many worlds, I had never known and showed me how I might enter them. The improbability of my pilgrimage struck me hard that morning. I realized how in many respects I had so little to do with it. It's a good confession to make. I make it to my friend and later to my professor too. More months pass and finally it's spring. For the first time in my life, I plant a garden. It's a tiny garden, a patch really. The soil, a thick, solid, yellowish clay, doomed the carrots. But the pumpkins are thriving. It hits me as I watch them grow. I don't need a waterfall anymore. And not even Paul Simon. Somehow I've been made to see that the creation is music. Any music of our own making just helps train our ears to this other ancient music that has been playing all the while. It's music that emanates from a world that hangs together in him a world delicately calibrated, plied and pieced together with supernal care, infused with a vibrancy we cannot name but clumsily with halting tongue. He waits for us to name it anyway, for it is his name. Waiting, he whispers to us what he has whispered over and over from the start. Choose life, human creature, choose life. He looks down 
and sees that we are like grass and that we are like sparrows and that we are like him. He breathes upon us again, knowing all the while the first words we'll find ourselves saying as we in amazement awaken in that other world, it was all a gift. For some, this will be epiphany accompanied by deepest terror. For others, it will be a refrain uttered in deepest love. It all comes down to what one makes of the blood. In terrible, beautiful fashion, it is our Creator's own blood that enables us, soiled and broken creatures that we are, to breathe this air, this fresh, clean, sweet air. Apart from this most earthy of washings, gratitude doesn't have a chance. Neither do we. Thank you.